Greetings, uh, Positive Technologies. Delighted to be at your conference today. Uh, my topic is Estimation is Dead, Long Live Sizing. So let's look into this a little bit more. So my link tree is at the bottom there, if you want to check me out. There's also a QR code if you want to check out my social details. If you're uh, wondering who I am, there's lots of John Coleman's in the world, but probably 30 million of them. So if you just put in my name and then the word agile after it, you should see me coming up um, straight away. I have a company called Ordinary Disruption, and there's also a product called Exagility, which is for executive agility. But today we're going to be talking about what happens at a team level, what also happens with mid-level mid management and so on in terms of how we set expectations in Scrum. A little bit about me, I'm an agility chef, also executive agility guide, and I'm product manager for X Agility. I'm on a couple of uh, lists, which is nice. I'm a flight levels coach, uh, pro Kanban trainer, also a scrum.org trainer. I'm also a less friendly scrum trainer. That's actually a thing. I wrote uh, a guide for Essentially, starting with Kanevan, the complexity framework using Kanban, you could also consider it uh, an expansion pack for Kanban. It's called Kanplexity. Uh, that was pub republished in September uh, this year. You'll find it on kanbanguides.org or kanplexity.org. I also created Exagility, a new ex executive agility framework, and I'm one of the co-authors of Kanban Guide at kanbanguides.org. I have two podcasts. One of them is Exagility, and the other one is Agility Island. I also run a few meetup groups as well. And uh, delighted to be here with you today. Thank you. So looking at the Scrum Guide, because this is about sizing and forecasting in Scrum, essentially trying to narrow it down to Scrum. I do operate in other areas as well, but this, this talk is primarily about Scrum. The word estimate, not sure if you notice this, but it, it's no longer featured in the Scrum Guide. It, in 2020, uh, there was a change to focus more on sizing uh, or, or size. And I guess that might be a little bit influenced as well by what's going on with the Kanban Guide for Scrum Teams as well, and that there's flow metrics there, which we'll talk about later on. And this focus on maybe throughput, how many items are we finishing, uh, that, that might be a new option that we can consider. So estimate is no longer in the Scrum Guide. And in terms of the word forecast, the Scrum Guide is actually quite flexible uh, about what you might use. A lot of people still think that burn-ups and burn-downs are needed, but actually they're optional. Uh, you can use pretty much any technique as long as it helps you to act and think empirically. Uh, and doing so would be deciding what to do next based on the evidence and the learnings from what we did last. So is estimation dead then? Well, let's first have a look at sizing. I reached out to a lot of communities, uh, product management community, uh, also design communities, uh, the no estimates community, uh, Kanban community, uh, Scrum community, uh, different uh, people in different organizations within the Scrum community, for example, as well. And um, it was a little bit of shuttle diplomacy, trying to figure out uh, what the line was for each community and could we find a way, something that they all kind of agreed on. It was a bit of a challenge, but uh, I, I think uh, in this talk and in the article which supports this talk on InfoQ that was published in August 2022, the link is on the first slide, which will be uploaded later on at the slide share. Um, it, this is a pretty good uh, summary of the discussions that I had with these communities. So for a few things first, some caveats. The people who do the work, they should do the sizing, nobody else. If you got complex work, we had Dave Snowden on the stage earlier today in Azerbaijan, for example, and he was talking about complexity. You might be familiar with the Kanevan sites making framework. Essentially, when you've got complex work, it's uncomparable to the work you've done before. So it's, it's kind of unpredictable, really. So it's uh, difficult to, to do sizing for complex work. And the other thing is, if we leave a mess behind us all the time, that mess kind of adds up. Some people might call that technical debt, although it's debt only if you plan to pay it back. Um, but uh, yeah, if you don't kind of clean up the kitchen, so to speak, that will catch up on you and it will affect your sizing and your forecasting later. 
And I would say that the most popular seismic techniques that are based on data are educated guesses. Some of the options include relative estimation, flow metrics, or, or counting valuable items and mixing and matching between flow metrics and counting a range of items, uh, right sizing, and uh, no estimates, hashtag no estimates. In the Kanban guide for scrum teams, there are four flow metrics. One of them is uh, work in progress, the number of items that have started that haven't finished. Work item age, how old is an item since it started, but it still hasn't finished yet. But when something finishes, it gets a cycle time. And that's the end date minus the start date plus one, we round up. And throughput is the number of items that we deliver in a particular time period. This will become relevant uh, later on in, in the talk. Here's some charts in relation to flow metrics. On the right-hand side, you can see a cycle time scatter plot. And so you've got calendar time going across the horizontal layer. And what I generally look for is if the cycle times are vertical and elapsed time is on the horizontal, I'm looking for cycle times that are either flat or coming down. But the, you can see that they were actually going up. And also what we can see is that the density of the dots, each one of those dots is when an item finishes, and some of those dots represent two items. Uh, the density, until such point as they, uh, the trend started coming down, the density of the throughput actually was uh, going down as well. So cycle time was going up, and our throughput was probably going down. Uh, but they managed to recover. They switched from a push system, uh, where people are pushing, working on top of them, even though they're not ready to take on the work yet, uh, they, they changed that to a pull system, even though all sorts of emergencies were turning up. It was actually quicker to leave something on the backlog because if they focus and finish, focus and finish and just get their work done, it was it was much better. So uh, in this particular situation, I saw um, a massive reduction in cycle time and throughput uh, at least doubled in the situation. You can see the throughput um, trend actually is actually tripled. Uh, you can see uh, the average throughput at the bottom left went from about a third of an item per day up to uh, one item per day uh, on average. But then there were some days we're doing two, some days we're doing three, and that trend was we're doing one or two in the most recent trend. There's also a work item aging chart as well on Actionable Agile, a lovely tool for seeing not only how old a card is on the Kanban board, but for that column where it is on the board, is that about the right time for that card to, uh, to be in that column or do cards leave that column sooner? Uh, than the state. So it's a really nice way of visualizing that. Uh, there are some tools as well, like Canvanize, where they actually, you can visualize on the card if the card is, is going late. Because what I find sometimes is, even if you got a nice little button at the top of the screen to go view analytics, I often find people won't, uh, they, won't they won't click that button. <laughs> so if they won't, uh, if you can't bring the horse to water, can we bring the, the water to the horse? And uh, that's one of the tricks that I do when I'm working uh, with teams. About relative estimation, uh, there's time reference, which is comparing current work items to items that we did before. Um, it's kind of interesting. So you, you, you think about maybe something you did a year ago. Oh, that's like something we did one year, and that took two weeks. That actually included the waiting time. You don't remember that you estimated you know, two ideal hours or three story points or whatever your measurement system is. You just remembered how long it took. So the waiting time is included, which is really interesting. You can use the numeric values, the most common being story points, and the most common scale for that being the Fibonacci scale, the combination of the last two numbers. Uh, where it kind of degrades a little bit is when people start using planning poker. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a nice thing to do to have a conversation and so on, but I, I just think it's a, a, a waste of time. I, had, I was working with a team and utilities company one day, and we took seven hours estimating the whole backlog and then we used an alternative te technique, which I'll show you later today, and it took us 15 minutes to get the same answer. Uh, it, might have, it was a slightly better answer, I think, actually. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about the upsides and downsides of these options. T-shirt sizing is a, an even quicker way to get to a size, and often we might get a size. This is a small, this is a medium, this is an extra large, whatever. You might even map uh, story point numbers to those as well. Sometimes people do that because people like to get numbers. So they can do forecasting stuff. So we'll talk about that later. Another riff on that would be wall estimation or table estimation. We have all the cards on, on the wall or the table, and there's kind of silent sorting of which items are the smallest, which ones are the biggest. Maybe some discussion when people are kind of uh, contradicting each other with the movements. 
you can do the same, not just with effort, but also with value. So you could end up getting a value size and a, a size size, <laughs> for want of a better expression, in terms of effort size. Um, and I'm going to show you some techniques, the, the most popular techniques. Uh, the longer version of the presentation goes into some other techniques and on the slide deck, you'll see some of those other options with the upsides and downsides of those uh, discussed as well. Um, so relative estimation comes in a variety of flavors. And if you estimate the best thing that can happen is that they're correct. Um, they're prone to the flaw of averages. Uh, there's a book by Sam Savage uh, on 50-50 and all that. But did, did you know, for example, that 50% of people perform below average? It's a joke, right? 50-50, you know, average. Um, the average of independent blind assessments, though, as maintained by Dave Snowden, it can actually be quite good. But what I often find is that we don't have blind estimates in scrum teams. Um, so if you can manage that, great, but uh, that's not what I see. Um, if you don't estimate at all, maybe you haven't wasted any time, actually, because maybe you just crack on and just get some work done. Because you know what? 99.9% .9 of the time, they're wrong. Uh, makes us feel better. Um, so is there, are there better ways? That's, we're going to have a look at these today. Another option is uh, right sizing. So right sizing is where you look at it, the next item that might be coming in and you're saying, well, yeah, and, our, and you saw in our flow charts a while ago, we, uh, the cycle time, I think the 85th percentile was, I don't know, was it 13 days or less or something like that. Um, and so we look at the item, we say, well, does this, does this item feel like one of those items that we finish in 13 days or less? Because if it does, uh, uh, great, we can bring it in. But if it feels bigger, we, we need to break it down. So we don't want to be bringing in elephants into the sprint, for want of a better word, right? So and so right sizing is really good. That's, it, it's, it's also good as well for the product owner, I think, because, uh, you know, you end up with lots more items. When, I, when people have lots of small, small, medium items, maybe they just need to be medium. Uh, it, we, we shouldn't be fretting about whether trying to make something even smaller again. Uh, we need to make, make sure that an item is always valuable. Uh, we lose the plot, actually, when we break down items and they, they're not valuable anymore. You know, you'd, you don't get the value until you do more work in the next sprint, for example. That would be an example where it's no value. An example of getting value would be you might do one example this sprint out of the 21 examples, and then you will elaborate more on those later on. And this supports the idea of counting items as well later on. There is a common misunderstanding that uh, that right-sized items need to be the same size. They don't. They just need to be less than your than your threshold, if you like. Um, uh, are they smaller to fit in? Uh, one warning is if you have teams where uh, they don't deliver stuff most days, uh, the quality of a forecast uh, that's based on the number of items, even if they're right-sized, would be lower. For example, if you had a two-week sprint and every item is delivered on the last day of the two-week sprint, uh, that means that most days the throughput is zero. So uh, it, that, that will affect the quality of forecasting. So be careful uh, with that one. And also be careful with the use of averages. Uh, no estimates is a very interesting uh, consideration as well. Uh, there are a number of different views actually within the no estimates community. And uh, this particular one here is uh, an interpretation on Vasco Duarte's work and also uh, spoke to Woody Zool as well um, and reached out to other people as well to see if they had uh, any input. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to strive for an even distribution of ballparks, item size, throw to backlog. So we're not, trying to, we're not trying to have everything the same size, similar to right sizing in a sense. And similar to uh, counting items or counting runnable tested stories, as, as Vasco would call it, uh, which would be done part of backlog items, I guess, from a, from a scrum perspective, but cutting through all the layers of the cake, so to speak, if uh, we use cake as a metaphor for value, we want to get a slice, a slice of cake, and we want to be able to demonstrate progress uh, in that way. Uh, there's a focus on simplification, uh, which is really nice. So with uh, Vasco, he tries to get those items down to maybe less than two days. Uh, you have to be careful you don't lose the plot with this, that you don't end up in a situation where you're counting items that are not valuable. Uh, the way Vasco seems to be going, um, as far from what I understand, is you might do some discovery, for example, because uh, I understand that lots of other people have the same view as well, that 60 to 90% of items should never be built. Um, so if you could do some cheap experiments to find out which items there are and, and try to discover better ideas, uh, that would be good. And, and no estimates really supports that idea. 
No estimates also likes the idea of right sizing and um, even slicing into 24 hour time boxes. And then you can use a thing called rolling wave forecasts where you can use basically min max intervals for uh, based on how we're doing right now. Instead of using averages, they use min max, which I, I prefer because you're looking at ranges then rather than uh, rather than averages. So uh, that's uh, no estimates. And in terms of the, here's an example of a rolling wave forecast with a kind of giving quite vague um, uh, indications about how much work might be done. So you can still count the number of items just like you do when you do right sizing. So a lot in common, I would say, but there are some nuances around no estimates. So looking at some of the more popular ones, uh, time reference is where you look at some item that maybe you did uh, a year ago and it took two weeks. And so it speaks to the customer's language because it talks about time. And it's it's kind of easy to pick reference items from the past. and and the waiting time is included. It's really simple to do, but it does require that you have some reference items from the past, and it can be prone to abuse by people who have a focus on keeping you busy. Um, so try to make sure all the time adds up so they don't want you to have any slack. And, and actually what we'll talk about later on is maybe it's a better idea to have more slack for the unexpected, but also so that we're able to help each other. Uh, downside also would be it's unsuitable for probabilistic forecasting, but you should consider it, I would say. Story points, a lot of debate about story points out there. It has some upsides, it's not all downsides, so it does help you to uh, reduce the likelihood that uh, elephant-sized items will come into your sprint, and it could be used to limit work in progress. It's, it, it's a way of limiting work in progress. It's an attempt, I guess, at doing that. And you could pick reference items from the past as well, say, well, that feels like that if we did the past. That was, uh, I don't know, 13 points, and this one was eight points. Um, to, the, there's nice conversations that come out of it as well. And it's often paired with T-shirt sizing uh, or wall estimation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you could actually combine it with probabilistic forecasting, and I have done that, but I haven't done that for a few years. I don't really recommend it. Um, because of some of the downsides we're going to look at now. The, the creator, Ron Jeffries, at least he thinks he created um, the idea of story points. Uh, he regrets the whole idea. They're only meant for the team. They were never meant for comparing performance across teams and so on. Uh, I often find the same product, same product backlog, we get different teams to the same estimates, the same reference items, and they still come up with different sizing. So uh, it doesn't quite work in my experience. Uh, the story points, uh, you obviously have got your numbers, which you can use in your forecast. And the real problems that I, I, I feel are, that are there with uh, story points would be to do with inflation. Uh, I had a client in the last year, and their CIOs told me that their velocity in story points doubled. So they didn't see any issue with performance. Well, when I looked at the flow metrics, and I had a lot of visibility to the flow metrics, um, at a, at a kind of a much higher level, I could see what was going on from a real value perspective. And I saw that throughput, the number of items delivered halved. And that's probably because if someone says, well, you know, how big is this item? Well, you know, is it a medium or is it a large? Well, if I'm being measured on velocity, which they were in this organization, I might say it's a large. And you know what? I might even say it's an extra large because I need to pay my mortgage kind of thing. Um, so it kind of leads to what I call BS story points as well, that story point bingo. Uh, and it's often planned with uh, planning poker, which takes a long time. So um, uh, there's a there's kind of a big problem with it as well, which I'll get to later on. Which not it's not just a story point problem, but I generally see abuse uh, when there are story points. I, I I've never seen good outcomes uh, with story points. If it's working for you, great, uh, but just be careful with what happens as soon as uh, people outside the team team think they can uh, measure your performance based on uh, how things are going with story point velocity. Then you can use t-shirt sizes, uh, much easier than story points. You, uh, uh, you can use it in combination with uh, wall estimation as well. Um, it's useful to kind of avoid bringing elephants into a sprint. Again, you can emit your work in progress, uh, very similar upsides, uh, but it requires very little detail. Um, Despite just using t-shirt sizes, that we always tend to turn it into story points anyway. So we end up actually with all of the downsides of uh, story points, even though we're using t-shirt sizes. Uh, wall or table estimation, uh, very similar upsides. Uh, but what you're doing here is you're guesstimating, um, you're guesstimating the effort 
and it's very, very quick. Essentially, any backlog that I've seen in the last five years, any backlog that I've seen, I've seen really big ones, uh, they were all effort sized within 20 minutes. And then the team did value uh, sizing as well uh, on the same uh, items in the backlog. And that took another 20 minutes. So like, you know, with a bit of discussion and so on, within an hour or so, we had a re-ranked backlog, you know, value divided by effort kind of thing, a, a broader perspective of value considering risk and, and other kind of considerations. Um, so Wallace, which is really cool, and it's if I did use some kind of relative sizing, that would be kind of my go-to uh, point. Um, it does get converted to numbers, but the biggest upside, uh, sorry, downside is that it's, the people have a kind of a one and done approach and uh, it does need to be revisited regularly. I think my favorite approach uh, of estimating would be guesstimating or counting the number or a range of number of items for a given goal. Um, people are, are able to ballpark that quite quite easily, um, but very little information. I remember I worked in, a, in, a, in an engineering company and they uh, they were able to actually come up with a rough uh, ballpark forecast based on guesstimates. We'll talk about the, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea later on, but with very little information, with the collective wisdom of you know really sensible people around the metaphorical table, uh, they were able to uh, come up with some kind of a sizing at least. And it can be used across teams as well, which is kind of nice. Um, uh, but people do prefer relative sizing and, and they almost cannot let go of this whole idea. What you mean, you've got, you're counting items, but different items are a different size. And we'll talk about that later, but it's, uh, that's something that people struggle with a little bit, even though actually we can see empirically that it's better. And uh, it's often misunderstood as well that items need, need, items need to be at the same size. And in non-software applications where I've been working for the last five years, uh, the, there is this whole concept in Kanban of work item types. Uh, for example, if you're marketing, you might have packaging work and communications work. Uh, in software, that tends to be not so much the case, but in non-software, uh, you would also see maybe product backlog item types, which isn't talked about so much. I think I'm the only guy who talks about that because um, I guess I work so much in non-software, but it's it's something that kind of muddies the water a little bit. And, you know, are we comparing apples with apples here? Or are we comparing apples with oranges? But again, this is also prone, prone to the use of averages. You can count your items, but then if start, people start saying, well, okay, we'll use that with your average throughput. Um, if you're counting items, or will you do it with your... Uh, uh, your average story points, if you use the story points, uh, people uh, tend to lose the plot uh, when, when that happens. Right sizing is really simple. Um, there's less analysis paralysis and it supports regular uh, uh, probabilistic forecasting. Um, it tends to be done just in time or in part of backlog refinement, so the whole backlog wouldn't be right sized. Uh, we don't really want to be uh, refining items down to small items uh, at the bottom of the backlog is that some of those items might never be delivered. It's also misunderstood as well that all items need to be the same size. They don't. They just need to be within our threshold. And there is a disconnect in the Kanban community about whether you can use split rate to support your probabilistic forecasting. So in other words, if you said, well, I've got between 50 and 75 items, 50 items we, that we know about, we think we might have another 25 new ideas. Um, there's a in, in one approach, what you can do is you can ask, well, uh, for each one of those items that we're looking at, uh, what's the probability that we'll have to create a new item because it's so complicated? And uh, is like every single one, every second one, one in three, one in four, one in five, one in 10, one in 20. And people usually say one in three to one in five. So you can add a multiplier, say if it's one in three, uh, go to the back again by another 33%. You, you could say, well, maybe we're just uh skinning the cat a different way and maybe that could have been just factored into the original sizing for instead of 50 to 75 maybe you grow both of those numbers by 33 percent or leave the one at 50 and, and grow the top number by 33 percent just get a bigger range there's a disconnect in the community about whether that's a, a good idea but if uh, most days the team doesn't have any throughput uh you know this is going to be a bit of a struggle no estimates lots of upsides um you're trying to split items as necessary, uh, maybe even into discovery, uh, cheap experiments to find out much better ideas. And small batch is the goal. And we forecast using data uh, based on runnable and uh, running tested stories. And and there, there's really an acceptance of uncertainty and imperfect information in the way it's conveyed as well. 
it's useful for recurring forecasts, very low time investment. And uh, uh, there is an acceptance that you can have a mixture of item sizes that we don't kind of, uh, we, we don't have, for example, a forecast based on right sized items, but actually there's a lot of items in the backlog that are uh, really, really big. Uh, so maybe it's a bit more aggressive in terms of going on the backlog and trying to mix, mix the items there. In the wrong hands, though, uh, spitting, you could be spitting items into non-valuable items. So breaking store, valuable stories, for example, into um, subtasks and using those as items that actually don't deliver value of, in of themselves, like having a meeting with someone. I mean, it contributes to value, but is there value in the meeting? Um, and also, uh, people prefer to be wrong uh, than uncertain, I find, as well. So it's kind of difficult, difficult sell, you know, but uh, it's, it's something you could consider, maybe. So is estimation dead? What, what, what's the disparity between sizing and how long work takes? Well, I had a guy called Stuart Souter uh, who worked with me uh, once, and uh, he said to me, John, that's about 10 minutes of work, but things are so crap around here, make that about three days. And that's because there's very little correlation between estimated effort and how long something takes. There's a lot of reasons why... Um, uh, things take a long time and uh, there's a lot of considerations you can see at the right hand side in terms of what people normally consider but the one thing that most people don't consider is waiting time and that's uh, that's a real problem here's a photograph from the last website and a little quote from henrik nieberg in his resource resource utilization trap video uh, you've got a fabulous one out of there um 100% resource utilization equals 0% flow. So think about that when you're trying to uh, max the utilization of your people and keeping everyone busy, or even yourselves trying to keep yourself busy, you're essentially making yourself so busy you're not able to help each other. So uh, things tend to take longer. You got dependencies and all these kind of things as well. If your forecasts are routinely correct, then we think you're a freak of nature. Because forecasting is rarely perfect due to a few reasons, like waiting time, for example. Even in straightforward working environments, people overestimate their capability. And often uh, people doing complex work in the pursuit of speed leave, out, leave work behind them that, is, that maybe they're not so proud of. Uh, that's known as accidental complication. J.B. Rensberger gave a talk about that. It's called 7 minutes, 26 seconds. So check that out on YouTube. And complex work uh, involves many unknown variables. And... There can be a lack of focus as well, uh, maybe too many things going on, changing priorities. So a lot of factors uh, impeding the quality of forecasts. Monte Carlo simulations allow you to model the future based on data and assumptions. You can say, well, our backlog is 50 to 75 items. Uh, we deliver between zero and two items per day. Uh, most of the time we deliver nothing. Sometimes we deliver one, sometimes we deliver two, although the team we saw a while ago, their throughput improves. So it's a much stronger basis for doing forecasting. And what Monte Carlo does is throws random numbers at the range of your backlog, how small it might be, how big it might be. It doesn't throw any numbers that are bigger than your upper limit or lower than your smaller limit, similar with your, with your performance in terms of number of items. You can also do that with number of story points. Um, and you can create a forecast. And... Uh, uh, basically, it might say, well, 85% chance the work will be done by a particular date, which means 50% chance it won't be done by a particular date. Uh, and then you, I mean, what you need to say is, but I'll give you a better forecast next week, which is a very nice way of saying we don't know, because in the complex space, we actually don't know. Uh, but I think it's better to do regular forecasts in, in cultures where uh, saying we don't know is, isn't an acceptable answer. And uh, I think people will probably get used to the idea that when they see the recurring forecast, they'll see that the dates are changing. And then they may realize that, oh, it's like the weather, uh, weather changes or product development changes. And so people are, with, we're kind of moving from managing expectations about dates to maybe managing expectations about uncertainty. You can also do Monte Carlo forecasts as well for uh, how many items we think we'll have done by a particular day. And uh, so this uh, is called Monte Carlo How Many, and there's also Monte Carlo When, which is the previous one that I showed you. So some options for managing expectations. Um, so essentially, uh, you could use a service level expectation uh, based on an educated guess. So on the left hand side, we've got estimate, estimate type. So if we don't know what the performance of our team is, you've got one new item, you say, well, how long do we think it takes us to finish one item? That you can start with a guess. It's a kind of a, 
um, is that uh, it's you know maybe it, maybe is, is that as desirable? I'm not sure, but uh, you can have an individual item size as well in terms of um, uh, the sizing that we talked about a while ago. So that be, that can be bad and that can be good, right? Uh, you can also have a guesstimate uh, probability forecast based on min maxes as well, and so at least you're using ranges and not using averages. Uh, you could also do it. You could do it based on items, or you can, uh, you know, you can also look at uh, the number of story points, for example. Um, so you can look at uh, how much throughput do we have against the range, uh, uh, range min max, or you can look at uh, guessing on both sides, guessing the size of the backlog, and guessing our performance, which is something that I have uh, come across most often because I uh, often get asked to help with new teams and so on. You could also do probabilistic forecasting with story points, which I don't really recommend, or you can use a story point range and and maybe do that. Uh, you can maybe do that uh, using uh, probabilistic forecasting, basically. So, or you can do do it based on averages. So the last one there should be saying based on averages. So, uh, be careful about averages. So, forecasting on the right hand side, you've got uh, service expectation based on data. So, if our charts, like scatter plot, plot is telling us. Well, this will take uh, 13 days or less. Well, that's our that's our data point. But you can also look at the item age. Once an item starts, that's the the what kind of age chart can give us an indication about whether that item is going to be in time. If it's in the green, it's probably going to be in time. If it's in the red, it's probably we're probably going to struggle. You can also have a data driven uh, probabilistic forecast uh, based on 90% uh, confidence ranges uh, based on the uh, the throughput uh, data of valuable items. You could have a rolling, rolling wave forecast, like I showed you earlier. You could uh, use throughput based on data averages, uh, which is uh, because it's using averages, it's not as uh, ideal. And then probabilistic story points based on data, uh, because of the weaknesses of story points in terms of inflation and bingo and so on, that becomes less useful, I would say. And then doing based on averages is really, uh, you're saying 50 50 heads or tails. And I'm not sure I recommend that. And counting subtasks is probably probably one of the worst things that uh, you could do. So these are some options, uh, but some better options would be maybe we need to manage expectations about uncertainty and not dates, uh, and say maybe we're using an empirical approach, uh, operating one sprint at a time. The sprint goal is not even a guarantee. The real answers we don't know. Uh, we, 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 we just start and run quickly. And you could even use something now, next, later, or something like that, but have really big question marks on those. Uh, or maybe how about being agile? Maybe you don't manage expectations at all and let people go and see. Uh, it depends on the culture of your organization, but you could discover and deliver capabilities. You could review outcomes of customers and end users, learn what, what can be learned, and then act on base on what we discovered. And is not kind of the most agile way of all. It's not being truly empirical, not kind of knowing necessarily for sure what we're going to do in the next sprint, but actually what do we learn? And if, that, if we're really being empirical, that should really influence where we're going to go next. Key takeaways, I would say avoid story points. Also avoid counting non-valuable items and counting undone work is done. Uh, maybe consider using historical time reference. Try probabilistic forecasting uh, based on um, the number of items. Try uh, rolling wave forecast as well. Maybe promote the idea of managing expectations about uncertainty over managing expectations about dates. There are also some ways as well to challenge the forecasts. Uh, the two that uh, three that I like the most would be future backwards, where you um, you say, okay, now based on this forecast, step backwards from that, you know, the road to heaven and the road to hell kind of thing, and and uh, you step backwards from that and see what might have happened. Uh, ritual descent as well as where people are, are given permission to be uh, to be to give dissent in terms of the forecast, really challenge it uh, to try and find holes in it because uh, uh, you know best. Best made plans and all that is it's better to find out now from friendly fire than you know the uh, real life kind of laying lay, laying a hard one on us. So uh, you know giving us a really hard lesson. So uh, also the reality tree as well from theory constraints, uh, lovely lovely technique. There are some other resources as well at the back of the deck, but I'd like to thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. Thank you so much.